Good morning, and welcome to Sabbath School at the Edmonds Adventist Church. I'm John Brunt, the pastor, and we are in a series of studies right now on how to interpret the Bible. Our lesson today is on the Bible as history. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we are so grateful for the gift of your word. May it truly be a guide to us. May it truly make us wise for salvation. And today, as we think about the Bible as history, we pray that your spirit will enlighten us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Sabbath school is going to be a little shorter uh, in that I have been in the past running right up uh, sometimes almost until 11 when we begin the worship service. But now that we are doing the worship service in a way that's a little more complicated, I have to end soon enough for us to be able to uh, plan and get on and make sure everything is working right. So at 11 o'clock following this, we will have our worship service. And like last week, we will be able to have more people involved. In fact, Today, uh, Craig Lang will be telling our children's story, and Troy Perry will be offering our prayer, and Josh Daniel will be singing for us. So I know you'll want to join us at 11 o'clock. The Bible as history. We have already seen in a number of these studies this quarter that the Bible is much more than history. After all, we've seen the different kinds of genres that we find in scripture. Poetry, proverbs, stories, laws, ordinances, apocalyptic literature, prophecy. But it certainly is true that much of scripture is history. Now, I want to look at three things today as we think about the Bible as history. Number one, I want to think about the historical character of the Bible and its theological significance. Then I want to talk about historicity and details in the Bible. And third, I want to talk about the role of archaeology, which has been so important in the study of the Bible. So number one, the historical character of the Bible. We begin in scripture by seeing that God is the creator. We talked about that last week. The Bible says that God has acted in this world. In fact, it's interesting that unlike some of the other stories of gods. In the Bible, the story of our God is intertwined with history. We don't simply see God as omniscient, omnipresent, and all of these other terms that we use for God. But God is seen as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, a God who interacts with human beings and acts in history. I think of that famous passage in Exodus chapter 3. Remember Moses was out there near Sinai, and out there in that desert he saw a bush that was burning. He was attracted to it, and when he came God spoke to him, and we read in Exodus chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. As Moses approaches, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. 
I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God is seen as a God who looks down and sees the oppression of people. He sees their slavery. He comes to liberate them. God is the God who acts in history to save. And of course, this story of God acting in history to save reaches its climax in Jesus, as God himself comes and lives among us to show us who God is. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus says, and to act for our salvation in his life, his ministry, his healing, his cross, and his resurrection. God is a God who acts in history. N.T. Wright, the famous New Testament scholar, puts it this way. Christians have ordinarily claimed that God has decisively revealed himself, not in the realm of existential consciousness, not in the recess of religious feeling, but in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, God has acted within the space-time universe, specifically in the dirt and drama of first-century Palestine, to make good on his covenant promises to Israel by sending his Son in the likeness of human flesh. You see, God is seen in Jesus Christ, and that is something that happens in history. It's interesting that when Peter introduces the message of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit comes on them, he goes back to Joel. He goes back to David. And when Stephen, just before he is stoned, tries to tell the story of the gospel. He does it by recounting history. Just a few verses from Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, just before he is martyred. Acts 7, verses 2 to 5. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land, where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even ground to set foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. And then he goes on through the history of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and down through history to the story of Jesus. When God is described in the Bible, it is not with a list of qualities like you might find in a systematic theology textbook. But it is with what he has done and how he has revealed himself in history through his covenant with Israel and through his incarnation coming in flesh. You see it not with a list of attributes, 
but with activities. You see, there is a story that runs all the way from Genesis to Revelation, from creation to new creation. This is the historical character of the Bible and of Christian faith. <coughs> so, clearly, the Bible is history. Not only history, but it is, we serve a God who, who cannot be seen, cannot be understood apart from what he has done in history. This is the historical character of the Bible and of Christian faith. Now I want to say something about historical details. Because sometimes people think that because our religion is a religion of history, because God acts in human history, then the whole inspiration of the Bible rests on its minute historical accuracy. And if there is found anything within the Bible that isn't simply absolutely historically correct, then the whole thing falls. That is not at all the picture, I believe, that we see in Scripture. There are two things we need to think about. One, certainly the basic message of Scripture must be reliable. And there are a number of evidences of this. If you studied the Sabbath School lesson quarterly, which I hope you did this week, there are a number of examples of how we see the reliability of the basic biblical story. But second, we need to understand as we talked about in the last lesson, that the Bible's inspiration doesn't stand or fall on simply its historical details. As Ellen White said, God and heaven alone are infallible. So do we find places where Details may differ within Scripture? Well, the answer is yes, we do. I don't think we need to go through contortions to try to prove that Scripture is accurate in every detail in order to believe in its complete reliability. For remember that what Scripture is to do is what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15. It is to make us wise for salvation. And within that context of the reliability of the basic biblical message, certainly as we look at Scripture, we do see little things that have differences in detail. We see it in the Gospels. For example, there's the story of Bartimaeus, a blind man that Jesus heals. According to Mark chapter 10, verse 46, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And then it goes on to tell how this blind beggar Bartimaeus cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus called him and healed him. And then he followed Jesus down the road. Notice it says they came into the city, and as they were leaving the city, they met Bartimaeus. Now Luke tells the same story in Luke 18, verses 35 and 36 but it's just a tiny bit different. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and then we go on and see Jesus heal him. So Mark's gospel said Jesus went into the city, and this happened as he was leaving the city. Luke's gospel says it happened as he was approaching the city of Jericho. 
Now, is that something that really matters when you look at the story? Well, some people would say yes. If that is something that's different, then uh, the whole inspiration of Scripture goes down the drain. Absolutely not. And so some people will go through all kinds of contortions to try to say there really isn't any contradiction here. I think of one writer who says, you know, in Jesus' day, there were two Jerichos. There was the mound, the tell, the place where the old city was, and then there was New Testament Jericho. So obviously, Jesus had passed the Old Testament city, which at this time was simply a, a pile of dirt that you would never know was a city, but he had passed it, and now he was approaching the New Testament city, the actual city of Jericho, where there were people. And so both are true. He was leaving and he was entering. I don't think we have to go through those kinds of gymnastics in order to affirm the reliability of Scripture. Another example, if you, I won't look at the details, but if you go through the four Gospels in telling about Peter's denials, there are little differences in who asked Peter the question and accused him of being a Galilean who was there with Jesus. And I think of one writer who says, well, we have to put all this together. There can't be any difference of details. And so he decides that Peter denied Jesus six times, actually, instead of three, in order to make everything come out just right. Well, I believe that the scripture is historically reliable in the big picture. But this kind of harmonization to try to make every detail be exactly precise, I just don't think is necessary. We need to look at the overall intent of Scripture, which, as Paul says, is to make us wise for salvation. The third thing I want to talk about today, the role of archaeology. It's been a wonderful thing that archaeology has found so much that has helped us understand the biblical world. But sometimes you will see these claims made, archaeology proves the Bible. Well, how can archaeology prove that Scripture is able to make us wise for salvation? I don't think it can. You see, the God who creates and acts within history to save us is not something that we can prove by historical detail. It's something that we have to experience and find through faith. So I don't think we can say archaeology proves the Bible. In fact, even if we were to prove all of the historicity of Scripture in every detail, that wouldn't prove what the Bible was really all about. It wouldn't prove that the Bible is able to do what Paul says it does in rebuking, in making us wise for salvation. So what does archaeology do? It certainly confirms the contours of biblical history. There are so many things that have been substantiated because we've been able to find the history there in the sands of the biblical world. Just a couple of examples. Remember, uh, go to your Sabbath school lesson. I hope you're studying it each week. And there are a number of examples there. In Jeremiah 40, 14, there's the mention of an Ammonite king named Baalus. Obviously one who serves Baal. 
Baalus, the Ammonite king, Jeremiah 40, 14. Well, do you know that there have been a couple of seal impressions found from this king, from Baalus, who was king of the Ammonites. And, of course, the king had a seal and would put it into clay. And a couple of those seal inscriptions have been found. One of them was found in a dig at Tel El Umeri. Now, for some of you that means something. For the others of you, uh, let me remind you, if you're at Edmonds, you remember that a couple of years ago, we had Doug Clark and his wife Carmen come and present a whole day seminar on archaeology. Remember that for Sabbath school, they had the kids up front and they did a show and tell and the kids were able to see these objects from biblical times. Well, Doug Clark was the leader of that, that uh, uh, dig at Tel El Umeri and um, supported by Adventist institutions. And they found this. So here is an example where we actually have the seal of this king who was mentioned in Jeremiah. There are several other things in Jeremiah where there are artifacts like that that give us an example of the actual person who is mentioned in Jeremiah. These kinds of historical references are important. But proving historical references doesn't prove that the Bible is the word of God that makes us wise for salvation. But it does give us confidence in its overall historical reliability. However, much more important have been the contribution of archaeology in showing us the culture and history. Well, let me say one other thing about substantiating history. Another thing that archaeology has done is substantiate the text of the scripture so that we know that what we are reading is really very close to what the original authors wrote. Remember, we talked a few weeks ago about how we don't have any of the original manuscripts that uh, were written actually by the author of Scripture. We have copies of copies of copies. But it has been so important that archaeologists have discovered um, in the sands of Egypt and in other places, older biblical manuscripts. And the major discovery out uh, in the Jordan Valley by the Dead Sea, of the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 1940s, where a shepherd boy was throwing rocks. There were holes in the caves. And if you have rocks around and you have some holes, kids are going to try to get the rock through the hole, right? And he heard something uh, break inside when he did that and found a jar that had old manuscripts in it. And of course, these scrolls have been found. You realize that every Old Testament book, except for the book of Esther, is found at least in fragments among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible were Oh, probably dating back to 8 and 900 A.D. Now we have manuscripts that go back a thousand years earlier than that. To two and three hundred years before the time of Christ. And we see how much the same they are. And it affirms to us that what we're reading really is what the biblical writers wrote. Same kind of thing in the New Testament. Pieces of papyri found in Egypt. In fact, there once was a time when some people thought that the Gospel of John probably wasn't even written in the first century, that it reflected some kind of later theology. And wouldn't you know it, but some of the very earliest manuscripts that have been found among the papyri are the Gospel of John, showing that it was certainly written in the first century. And not all that long from, it's just a few verses, but not all that long from the time it would have been written. And we see that what we read in Scripture is substantially what they wrote. Obviously, as we talked about the other day, some 
differences among manuscript, the scribes would make mistakes, but the vast majority of confidence that we can have that what we read in scripture is really what was written. Thanks to the discoveries of manuscripts. But you know, I think the greatest contribution of archeology span is showing us the history and culture of scripture helps us make the Bible come alive. For example, in 1986, I believe it was, they discovered in the mud, there was a drought around the Sea of Galilee and it became much lower than usual. And they found a boat, a boat from the first century that was a fisherman's boat from first century fishermen fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Now, we don't know if they were any of the fishermen that came in contact with Jesus, but we know that this was a boat like the ones that followed Jesus would have been fishing in. And to stand there and look at that boat and kind of get an idea of what their boats looked like and how this boat would have been out there on the Sea of Galilee, it certainly makes scripture come alive. And archeology span has done that in so many ways. It's given us an understanding of what life was like. The best example of a typical house in Old Testament times was found at Tel Elumeri and were able to see how people lived and what the house was like. And, you know, they're even able to do studies to find out what it was that were, was cooked in the kitchen so we know what they were eating. So there are examples of, uh, there are books that you can read that will help make scripture come alive as we see the history of the times of scripture. I love to go over and see those things that come from the first century world. We have visited Europe a few times. It's been a while now, but when we do visit Europe, my wife keeps saying to me, you know, there are things to see in Europe besides Roman ruins. But somehow I'm drawn to those Roman ruins where you can stand in a theater or look at an amphitheater or old temples and get a feel for what the New Testament world was like. So the Bible would certainly lose its power to show us who God is if we didn't think about the Bible as history. Because our God is not just a philosophical concept. Our God is a God who has acted in history, who has left his footprints in, as N.T. Wright said, the dirt of Palestine, because Jesus came to show us in our history what God is like. And the story of scripture from Genesis, where God created, to Revelation, where God recreates and restores a new heaven and a new earth, is a story. It is a history. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We will continue our studies in how to interpret scripture next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, same time, same place. I hope you'll join us then. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are a God who is not simply a concept, but a God who has come to live among us. And we know that you came to us in Jesus. We know that now you continue to come to us through the Spirit who continues to bring the presence of Jesus to us. 
And we look forward to the day when you will come to bring about a total new heaven and new earth that will fill the whole universe. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll be with you in about 25 minutes for the worship service. I hope you will join us then.